indicated last week that uh, we've included in our calendar program this year uh, occasional focus on the family subjects. And so last week I, I started and didn't finish. It should have been one week, but it's two weeks that I want you to look at this, this topic of protecting the family. And Carol reminded me this morning, driving from the hill, is we are bombarded with what is being called a sexual revolution in the world today. And we, we don't often speak about it in the church. And so uh, I want to urge you this morning, I think the way Sol Solomon does, let us be aware, very aware of God's ways. They're different to the ways of the world and of the flesh. And our desire, of course, is to please God. And so just a single verse, I want you to read from Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 32. I think it sums up the challenge that uh, we are addressing. Solomon says in chapter 6 verse 32, He who commits adultery lacks sense. He who does it destroys himself. So, Lord, as we continue on this topic this morning, we do so, Lord, as those who know that we fall so short of your glory in so many different areas, different challenges that we face as men and women, as younger people, as older people. But I pray as we seek to address, Lord, this particular topic this morning, that you would equip us, protect us, so that we may walk in ways that are pleasing to you, living lives of holiness and purity to the glory of your name. And so, Lord, even that song that we've just sung, Spirit of God, won't you be uh, at work falling afresh upon us, stirring a passion for your name, as we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want to begin just to introduce the approach in this message this morning by speaking of a uh, of a, one of our members, a number of years ago, had to undergo some very serious surgery. There were risks involved, there were vulnerabilities, but he delayed. He waited before he had the surgery. Instead of going ahead immediately, he gave enough time so that he could donate blood, his own blood, in the event that he would need that blood during the operation. Now, of course, I asked him why I did this. And he said, well, I'm taking preventative action. This is a preventative step to ensure that there would be no risk to himself by using donor blood. This was the time, of course, when there was all sorts of controversy and confusion about, about AIDS-infected blood from the blood bank. It was safer, he felt, to donate his blood in advance. Now, in the same way, Surely, it makes good sense to take some kind of proactive, preventative action to avoid the risk of sexual indiscretion. And I, and I want to widen that this morning. We're not just speaking about a married man or woman having an affair. There's a lot going to be said about that. But there are all sorts of other areas of risk and vulnerability. It makes good sense to have a plan. How do you avoid, how do you prevent falling into this trap of sexual sin? I remind you that we Christians, believe it or not, believe it, it's important, Christians have no automatic immunity against any of these failings. Whether it be a Christian marriage and adultery, whether it be single people in uh, falling into fornication or whether it be pornography so for single or married people, even homosexuality. There are desires within us that rage and we battle with, we struggle with them. The battle for purity is real. Most of us, all of us, suffer and struggle and it therefore needs to be faced head on. Last week, we remember that, I hope you remember, uh, we considered what I call the importance of recognizing the possibility of an affair. Any one of us can fall or fail. The possibility exists. 
But secondly, I try to consider, try, try to show you that there is a price tag attached to sexual sin. All sin is sin, and we need to understand and know that, but there are certain sins that have a concentric circle of consequence. Or perhaps to use another analogy, there is a domino effect. It's not just the individual involved, but many, many others are affected by the sin of an individual or two people. But today I want to move on, and I want to look at more detail now at what I want to call the pathway into the snare. If you know the route into this particular sin, it enables you to be more prepared to avoid it. And what we need to recognize, of course, is people don't just instantly fall into immorality, especially Christians. It's our desire to please the Lord. We want to walk away of holiness. We understand the scripture that says that without holiness, no man will see God. We understand that the spirit of God is grieved when we sin. And, and so it's, it's not something that, that just suddenly occurs. It doesn't just hap <coughs> excuse me, happen. The road to immorality normally involves a process. And so being aware of this process or this pathway just heightens our awareness and it also provides an antidote it enables us to to face the challenge and and conquer it to have victory i want to show you this process today because by doing so we're putting a face uh, to what lois Moday calls the ushers or escorts who are so willing to lead you into the bed of an adulterer what do these ushers look like? What do these escorts look like? What is it that, that you need to be aware of in this process of failing or falling? Now, Lois Moday, in this book I mentioned last week, The Snare, identifies four different steps. And I'm going to run through those steps this morning. And, and the first one is, is just that of thoughts. Mere thoughts. Your mind. And again, we notice in the book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, where Solomon goes to great lengths to ensure that the mind is well informed, that there's been a digesting of the instruction of the Word of God, repeatedly, repeatedly, and it's not just in Solomon's writings, but you will see it in Deuteronomy, you will see it in Paul, you will see it in Jesus, you will see it in Peter. There's, a, there's an encouraging, there's an urging, there's a prompting, impressing the truth of God upon the minds and hearts of people. In Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23, Solomon puts it this way, For the commandment is a lamp, and teaching a light. Don't underestimate the power of the mind. The mind, therefore, must constantly be kept in check. Sometimes we think our, think our mind is like a bit of precast concrete, but it's not. It's a vital organ, not only in terms of your thinking and your intelligence. It's a vital organ. It's a dynamic, impressionable organ. And that which impresses upon the mind will influence your decisions and your actions the way you conduct and the way I conduct myself. It's therefore uh, why Paul, when he urges the believers in the light of the gospel, uh, I urge you to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto God. This is the consequence of, of the gospel. The, 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 the thing you need to do is give yourself to God, but he doesn't just leave it there. He tells us how. How will you do it? Well, do not be conformed to this world. There's a different way with God. Be transformed, be changed by the renewing of your mind, our thought life that which enters the mind, that which we meditate upon in our thinking. And immediately, in my mind, I'm, I'm thinking of Psalm 1, the man who delights in the law of the Lord. He's the one who meditates on this law day and night, and his life is like trees planted by streams of water. There's, there's a different picture of the person who allows himself or herself to be influenced by the Word of God. I've heard... I've, 
I've hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Let me give you an example how easily your mind and my mind is influenced. You're watching a movie. Think of yourself, Friday night, Saturday night. Switch on a movie, and it's a, it's a story about a man and a woman who are married, and the husband is a tyrant. He's a dog. Treats his wife badly. He's unkind to her. He's demanding of her. He's insensitive to her completely, and she just suffers. And in the unfolding of the movie, this struggling wife comes across this very nice man, and he's everything her husband isn't. He's kind, and he's considerate, and he's loving, and he, he, he cares for her. And I don't know about you, but I know what I begin to think. Divorce the baddie and marry this guy. And, and I'm a Christian, and I'm, I'm committed. I'm committed to faithfulness. I'm, I'm committed to, to God's way. But you see what happens? The mind, the mind influences the emotion which leads to decisions, decisions that may not be uh, in line with what is pleasing and honoring and prescriptive from God. We who hold to faithfulness in marriage can so easily find ourselves sympathetic to a breakup even in a marriage in favor of that which is not God's will. My point that I'm trying to urge on us here this morning is that any kind of sexual sin begins in the mind. Undisciplined thinking, undisciplined input just take for a moment or think for a moment of Potiphar's wife. I'm sure she was probably quite happily married to Potiphar until Joseph arrived on the scene. And initially there probably was nothing in it. But more and more she thought about Joseph. He was handsome, the Bible tells us. And she thought of him. She liked him. She began to fantasize about him. And so there's a progression that leads to sinfulness, but it begins in the thinking of the mind. We have the same <clears throat> process that happens in the life of David. 2 Samuel 11 verse 2. It happened, of course Bathsheba is what I'm referring to. It happened late one afternoon. David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house. He's looking. He's looking at the scenery. But sure enough, his eyes find this beautiful lady bathing in the sun. A woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. Now you can imagine, imagine David in his thinking, and it's, it's in his mind, and, and, and David sent and inquired. You see, it, it develops about the woman. And of course we know, and the pattern is there. The road to destruction begins inside of the head. Every thought, therefore, must be taken captive. Not once. Because this, this is not an issue that we deal with and have victory today and it's forever solved. The reality of sexual temptation will come today and it will come tomorrow and it will come next week and it will come when you're 15 and when you're 50 and even when you're 90 and 100. Right? It, it continues to be there. And so the mind must be protected. Daydreaming, even at times when we escape the world we live in to a world of make-believe or fantasy. Sometimes we think it's legitimate. Vulnerability. I, I, a very good friend of mine, many of you will remember him committing suicide. Do you know where his journey, Daniel, started? In a chat room on the internet. And he told me about the opportunity in this chat room and he said to me, don't worry, don't worry about me. This is just a game. It's just a game. It's a game of make-believe. It's, it's, it's trying to live a life that you can't live here. It was his first step on the road to destruction. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 25, Solomon again, he says, Do not desire her beauty in your heart. 
Now, when they make reference to the heart in the Jewish culture, it includes the mind. Do not let her capture you with her eyelashes. And so, can I ask this morning, ask myself this question, and we need to do it repeatedly. Is there someone you find yourself thinking about more than you should? Number two, emotional, non-physical involvement. Remember, we're talking about the process here, uh, the pathway into an affair. This is the second step. So the mind has been active. And then, of course, as Christians, and I think most people, in fact, we confuse the words sexual and physical. We think they're the same thing. Uh, sorry, we think, we think that they are different. We say that nothing sexual is going on in a relationship when actually we mean there's nothing physical going on in the relationship. And the truth is when we are involved with people in an emotional way, something involving the sexes is going on all the time. An emotional entanglement can be developing under the umbrella of legitimacy. You see, it's not uncommon to hear that an illegitimate relationship had its beginnings when a man or woman started to share their troubles and concerns with a friend or colleague. It just starts innocently, sharing, opening their heart, making themselves vulnerable. And there is in the dynamic of people this, this entanglement that begins to take place that we're not aware of. Naively, we conceive or convince ourselves that because there's nothing physical, that's the point I'm trying to make. We think because there's nothing physical, there's nothing sexual. But the two people, they know beyond the voice, there's already a connection. In this kind of situation, you begin to find there's always a reason to be in the company of this person. I think I mentioned last week, and again, I'm speaking off the top of my head now, which is always dangerous, but I spoke to a group of uh, students recently telling them of a failure of pastors in the ministry, and, and their huge percentage of pastors fail because of sexual sin. And you know why that is? It's because we pastors deal with people, and people share their troubles with us. And so, and so there's always that risk, there's that vul vulnerability and, and, and danger. Another instance, when we first entered the ministry in Peter Maritzburg, this is a, a bad story and a good story. Uh, Carol went to a beautician and she was uh, witnessing to her. She was an unbeliever at the time. And she said that she just divorced her husband. In fact, her husband had divorced her because she had committed uh, adultery. And uh, Carol shared the gospel with her and she was very open to the gospel. And, and eventually she brought her so that we could speak to her together. And uh, this girl was converted. And in fact, the good side of the story is her and her husband, we were involved in them reconciling, and I remarried them. But she confessed to me. Well, confessed to me. She said this to me, to us. She said, it started, it started when I was on a run. And I noticed that this old boyfriend of mine was in the garden of this house that I ran past. The first time we just waved and I ran past. But she said after that, every run I planned to run past his house. Looking, you see, you see the heart, the heart of man, the heart of woman, it's deceitful. And then of course you find the signals in this process of emotionally entangled, waiting for response, maybe body language. Two thirds of what we communicate is not verbal. It's nonverbal communication, especially the eyes. The way you use your eyes, the connection between a couple emotionally entangled is strengthened by the long stare. I'll look at a guy, not at a girl. Looking deep into the eyes. Lois Moda again, Moda calls this a kind of gray area where much Game playing occurs. And then that's normally followed by compliments, a certain amount of teasing, 
But all the while, there's a growing willingness and openness and uh, sharing of deep feelings and, and problems. And this emotional connectedness is growing, growing, growing. And eventually, it's established and solidly in place. And all is justified because the person or persons are saying to themselves, nothing physical, it's okay. I'm not doing anything wrong. And there's a false sense of safety, a false sense of well-being, because no actual physical transgression has taken place. But then, of course, inevitably, the touch, the innocent hug, the peck on the cheek, and the line is crossed onto the third step in the process, physical involvement. Only number three. Number three in the process. One thing leads to another, and then it's a law that I call the law of diminishing returns begins to apply. What satisfies today doesn't satisfy tomorrow, and so the touch develops into a kiss, and the kiss develops into further uh, involvement, and eventually uh, sexual intimacy takes place. After the first time, guilt pervades. Guilt is even crushing. And their promises made to each other and even to themselves. We will not do this again. But it happens. Normally. Again and again. And then the fourth step is taken. Rationalization to live with an affair. I want to tell you something about uh, us people. We are psychological beings that need to maintain emotional equilibrium. Now, be with me for a minute. When I was a little boy, my mom sent me to the vegetable shop. Those old vegetable shop owners used to have those scales where you had these different weights. I don't know if you still get them today. And then they'd put one pound even, two, one kilo, and then they'd put the potatoes on this side, and eventually the, the scale would tip. But there's a place of equilibrium. Do you know what I'm saying? When, when the one weight is equal to the other weight and it's just perfectly in harmony, it's in a straight line. We are like that emotionally. We have to live in emotional equilibrium. Now, the problem with physical engagement or the third step that I mentioned is that one side of the scale gets filled with guilt and we, we, we are then uh, placed into a situation outside or out of equilibrium emotional equilibrium. The guilt piles up and this side is weighed down and this side is up in the air. Now you can't cope as a human being because you're then not emotionally stable. There isn't this balance. But life has to go on. The emotions are in place. The physical activity is happening and the guilt is there and the guilt is piling up. And so to maintain emotional equilibrium, we do something to balance the scales. And we begin to add to the other side of the scale all sorts of criticism and justification for what we do. We've got to balance this thing. We've got to give reason why this thing is okay. And normally you will find that it's criticism of the partner, but it really falls under the heading of justification or self-justification, why this thing is acceptable, why this thing is in order, and it compensates and it brings the scale back, it brings your emotions back into equilibrium. Does that make sense? He never speaks to me like this, nice man. He's always so abrasive and, and so unfair to the children. She's so inconsiderate. And I've even had somebody say to me, I've prayed about this and surely God wants me to be happy. Emotional, emotional equilibrium. And the person involved begins to suffer. This is the problem. With terrible short-sightedness and no amount of reason or argument can convince them otherwise because they lose sense. They lose all sense of rational thinking. Even the most intelligent man or woman sinks into irrational and illogical justification that this kind of behavior, that this affair is good. Well, those are the four steps I really would like us all to be aware of in the course of our lives and relating to other people. 
But just secondly, I want to talk now about the pathway to avoid the snare. We don't want to slip on the banana peel. Let's avoid the banana peels. How do we do that? Well, I, I did think immediately, immediately my mind went to Jesus and what he taught about the narrow and the broad gate. Impress upon your own life the truth that Jesus, when he speaks about salvation in his broadest terms, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and the way is easy that leads to destruction. Simply because everybody's going in a certain direction doesn't mean it's the right way. Understand in your mind that there is a narrow way that is God's way, and therefore we need to apply the principles of God and see whether we can walk that particular pathway to avoid the snare. A couple of things I want to, to mention. Uh, stick to the narrow road where prevention, that's the issue, prevention is better than cure. That's a naughty thought. We wouldn't have so much load shedding at the moment. Isn't it true? If proper preventative maintenance had been exercised over the last who ever knows how many years. Prevention is better than cure. Those who are engineers will understand that. You can't run a machine and never do. You can't drive your car without having a service from time to time. Preventative, that's it, preventative maintenance. Now, what is the preventative maintenance, if you like, that we need to avoid an affair? Number one, keep your relationship with Christ strong. Now, you're saying, come on, man, tell us something new. There's a mistake we make, especially those who are very involved in the church. We think and we confuse that a vibrant relationship with Christ is about ministry busyness. It's not. And I'm, 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 I'm exposing myself here today because there is a danger for me as a pastor, and I've been there, where I, I, I fool myself into thinking because I'm leading Bible studies and preparing for Bible studies and I'm preaching and I'm preparing for preaching and I'm visiting and I'm counseling and I'm going to hospitals and I'm busy <coughs> six, six days a week that everything is well with God. It's not true. It's not true. What happens in the privacy of your own life, in your own heart, is crucial with God. Of course, the outward and the visible has a place, but the inward and the spiritual is crucial. Listen to James in chapter 4. He says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Of course, resisting sexual sin. But his very next words, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Intimacy with God. I've already said, and I'm going to say this again and again this year, I come back from my holiday thinking about the future and ministry at Central. Do we love Jesus enough? I think we can love him more. All of us. Growing, growing daily. Loving Jesus more and more. You know, it's like a sailing yacht. I'm not a sailor, but I think I know at least this about sailing. That which is below the surface or the waterline is what really counts. Keeps the yacht steady. Your relationship with Jesus, not the ministry you do, the intimate relationship, the the connectedness, abiding in Christ, loving Christ, these things are crucial in avoiding sexual sin. Now a word to those who are married and those who hope to be married. Uh, secondly, uh, if you want to prevent this kind of trouble in your life, uh, work at understanding and meeting your partner's needs. I mentioned this in passing last week, but I want to develop it a little today. A little bit today. Your wife or your partner, your husband, has legitimate needs. And we need to make every effort to understand and meet them. 
I reminded somebody this week that Christians should have an attitude in relationship of giving, not receiving. You see, most people, certainly outside of the faith, driven by the flesh, that passage we read in Ephesians 2, uh, will find that their life is about what's in it for me. Why do I get married? You know, what's in it for me? What, what is she doing to serve me or to love me or to fulfill my needs? Well, that's not the way of Jesus. We know, of course, Jesus said to his disciples um, that he did not come to be served, but to serve. Give his life as a ransom for many. It is, it is giving. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. It's giving. And, and so how can I give? How can I serve my wife if I don't know her needs? How, how do you do that? And so you have to know your, your spouse, your wife, your husband. And a couple of things about that I, that I want to add. You will discover, if you take the time and the trouble, that your spouse may not have the same needs and the likes that you have. You know, sometimes we think, man, I like this. Why doesn't she like it? Just something perhaps neutral about Carol and I, but uh, telling you something about us. If we sit on the couch and uh, we're watching a bit of TV or whatever, uh, Carol likes to put her feet up on, on my lap. And one of the things she really likes is for me to massage her feet. In fact, not just me, our, our, our kids too. If they are willing to massage your toes, she really likes that. I hate it if somebody... I hate it when somebody touches my toes. You see, no, I like to massage your feet. Okay, so don't misunderstand me. But don't touch my feet. Okay. We're different. We're different. And then, of course, men need to see that women are different to men, and, and women need to see that the women are different and the men are different to women. Yeah, we're different. We're made differently. God made us differently. We have to understand that. Husbands, use your brains as you live with your wives. That, that's a translation uh, uh, of, of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. We know that women love to talk. That's true, mostly. And be heard. Men want to talk less and just, man, let's just solve the problem and get on with it. You've got to understand these differences. And so therefore, each partner striving through listening, talking, understanding, get to know, get to know what your partner likes and dislikes. What's pleasing? Even, even there's certain perfumes I know that Carol likes and she doesn't like. Uh, get to know them. Um, uh, know what she likes and doesn't like and know what he likes and, he, and serve one another. It's good preventative maintenance. Here's another one. It takes a little bit of courage to do this. I call it assertive communication for those who do marriage preparation. Be honest with your partner about the state of your marriage. It's a hard thing to do, believe it or not, but we all need to be bold enough to ask the question, how are we doing? When last did you ask your spouse that question? How are we doing? Really, how are we doing? I mean, we, we live in the same house, we know that. We sleep in the same bed. We share the same children. We even go shopping together. But it's like, it's like we're two passing ships in the night. There's a lack of connectedness and intimacy. Ask. And when you're doing so, be careful. Be careful of being defensive. Be careful of resorting to mudslinging. The important thing to understand is the way your spouse, or in fact anyone perceives a relationship, whether it's accurate or not, is reality to them and cannot be ignored. Right, number four, and, and uh, try to be quickly with these. Another means of preventative maintenance is be disciplined and discreet in your relationship with the opposite sex. You heard, I said something that, about that last week. Be careful, be careful. None of us is immune. And, and I know we live in a world where we have contact with so many people. But the, it just means that the potential and the possibility is there to spark something off. A couple of guidelines again from Moda, and I'll just mention her. I really recommend this book. Avoid provocative questions. Somebody who's not your wife 
wife or not your husband. Don't listen to complaints about a lousy spouse. Sometimes we feel good when somebody uh, feels they would take us into their confidence to speak about their husband. No, you tell them, you tell them, you don't speak to your husband. And if you can't speak to the husband, get, get a counselor involved. But don't open this opportunity for emotional entanglement. Don't fish for compliments. Be careful about the compliments you pay. Great hair is okay, but I think great legs is over the line. Flirtation may be nice, a nice game to play, but it's a dangerous game to play. My view is be careful of touching. I've said this before. Not all men are attracted to all women, and not all women are attracted to all men. There's a connection sometimes between, not sometimes, between certain personalities and you can touch 20 people on the hand but there's one person you will touch and something will happen God against being alone with a person of the opposite sex and I know that's a difficult thing in today's world plan things that don't lead you into trouble right last thing and I want to deal with this quickly is the pathway back from court in the snare. So we've looked at the, the process into an affair, which helps us in preventative maintenance. I've tried to look at some of the, the ways we can avoid the affair, but now what happens when we fail? And again, remember the scripture. It's a wonderful scripture. Do not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate. Grace to the sinner. And we're all sinners. So if, if, if you're someone this morning that has failed here, yeah, well, you failed in this area. Somebody else has failed in another area. So we all fall short of the glory of God. No one, I'm certainly not wanting to hold one person up another one today. I'm, I'm just teaching on a subject to prevent dishonoring God and unnecessary pain in people's lives. But if you're there, if you've fallen, if you've failed, there's a way back. There's a way back for, let me qualify this, for the sincere repenting person. Repentance means acknowledging the sin, confessing that sin, and turning to Christ for forgiveness. Basic Sunday school Christianity. Repenting from sin. It's not an easy road, and uh, maybe just to make one or two points about it as I uh, try and wrap this thing up, some necessary steps. It's easy to talk about repentance, but what do we mean? Number one, if you're serious about repentance, you need to be thinking about and reestablishing your relationship with Christ. Because if you've been sinned, you've drifted away. There's a wedge. Any form of sexual indiscretion, the relationship with God has been affected. Do not grieve this Holy Spirit of God to whom you were sealed for the day of reje rejection. And where there is grieving, there's a wedge. There's a, there's a, a gap. And so, and so we mustn't fool ourselves into thinking that matters of the heart with God don't matter. They do, they do. And I'm back to that thing. Listen to, to David just expressing his, the weight on his shoulders when he was in an unrepentant uh, state. For when I kept silent, in other words, I was trying to hide everything and cover up, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of the summer. This guy is weighed under because of the guilt of sin. But then, of course, when he, he was confronted by Nathan, when he repented of that sin, and he came before God, we have that beautiful Psalm 51, create in me a clean heart, O God. Intimacy back with God. Taking a step back, looking, looking at ourselves inside. Psalm 139, search me, O God. Don't justify sin. Take the low road. I'm trying to teach my young girls, my daughters that at the moment in relationships. Take the low road. Don't worry about the high road. If it means asking for forgiveness, ask for forgiveness. It's me, O oh Lord. That's what David says in Psalm 51. It's me that sinned against you. Repent. And of course, accept the forgiveness of God. 
I have to make this comment, and then that's my last comment before conclusion. In the event of an affair, now I want to go back to those four steps. Even if at the moment it's just in your head, or if it's at the stage where there's emotional entanglement and you're beginning to enjoy the company of somebody more than your wife or more than you should, or if there's already physical involvement, end the affair immediately. Not because you feel like it, because you don't feel like it. End the affair because that is what is pleasing to God, that is what is right. Expect to feel terrible. You will feel terrible. Expect opposition from the devil. You will get that. And slowly, and it's going to be slow, I promise you, slowly rebuild your marriage. That this understanding that this is going to take time, patience, wisdom. It's normally good to walk a road with a counselor in the way forward. Marriage is a gift from God. It's a beautiful gift from God. And I want to remind you of that this morning. But it's a gift that you have to protect and look after. Protect it as a single person. Now, I know there's singles here this morning. You think, oh, I'm not married. Well, you're going to be married, more than likely. Protect that marriage already now by sustaining a lifestyle of purity. It will make the world a difference in the marriage to come. If you're married, treasure your marriage. Build your marriage. Cultivate the relationship. Keep the marriage bed pure. Glorify God in this area of sexual purity. In a world that says it doesn't matter, but it matters to God. And Lord, as we conclude, just this exhortation in an area that really challenges us all, I do pray that by your Spirit, you would give us, Lord, desire and intention to pursue a path of holiness, the pathway of purity in relationship and sexual activity. Thank you for the gift of marriage, even for the gift of sex. Your creation, you made it. You designed it. May we use this, Lord, in ways that are pleasing to you. And I do pray today as we've envisaged or intended over these two weeks that families may be protected, that children may be kept from the hurt of separation and pain and brokenness, mom and dad parting ways, that husbands and wives may be kept from the feelings of rejection, hatred, bitterness, and so, Lord, we pray, we pray for each other today. None of us exempt. As we go from this place, keep us, we ask, in Jesus' name.